<laughs> All right, so our first afternoon session at Big Talk from Small Libraries 2021 is The Lone Librarian, as I'm sure many of you out there are. Um, there's lots of, uh, of you there. And uh, Lauren Hinman is from our Midland University here in uh, Fremont, Nebraska, is going to talk about her experiences being a lone academic librarian. Yeah, so thank you for that introduction. Um, my name is Laura Hinman. Um, my presentation is, yes, The Lone Librarian, Programming Creations and Cultivating Connections. Um, so just a little bit about me. Um, I'm originally from South Dakota. Um, I got my Bachelor of Science in English for New Media from Dakota State University, and um, that university is in Madison, South Dakota, small town. Um, I um, then went on to get my master's in library and information science and a grad certificate in archives and special collections from the University of Southern Mississippi. Um, and coincidentally, my um, library career um, like job wise um, began in Mississippi as well. I had started school first um, and then I just ended up having a job. Um, I got hired down in Mississippi too. So I started as a cataloging metadata librarian and moved up to head of CERC and then collection development coordinator. And now I'm back in the Midwest um, as head librarian at Midland University in Fremont, Nebraska. Um, and that's just a picture of my family. And then um, in about four weeks time, we're gonna um, be expecting a little boy coming in. Um, oh, congratulations. So, <laughs> thank you. So pretty exciting and crazy that it's happening so quickly. But um, so this is my um, presentation description that was also on the um, website. Um, but just to give you another idea of what's, what I'm gonna talk about, um, so I started my position um, at Midland University as the only librarian. Um, and just that in and of itself, I think is kind of makes us unique because um, a lot of our um, kind of sister schools, I guess, in the GPAC um, division has um, more than one librarian. So here is just me. Um, I'm all by myself. Um, and before I came in, there were limited engagement opportunities between myself and the campus community. Um, so before I came, there just wasn't, there wasn't a lot of communication, there wasn't any outreach, there wasn't any um, uh, education on library resources, where you can find those resources, how to navigate them. There really just wasn't any, anything like that. And so when I came in, I made it my goal to establish um, the programming, that strong communication and trustworthy relationships between myself, uh, faculty, staff and students. Um, so I'm just going to talk about how I created those um, passive and event programs. Um, what assessments that I use to track attendance, feedback and suggestions. Um, and how I built communication and trust across campus um, that was non-existent before I came in all while being all by myself. <laughs> um, so a little bit about Midland, if you're unfamiliar with us. Uh, we are a small um, private uh, liberal arts university. Um, our FTE is uh, 1388. Um, we actually got record enrollment this year, which was you know, a surprise because of COVID, we didn't know what was gonna happen. So we ended up getting record enrollment this year. Um, we have 44 majors, 20 minors and 19 endorsements. And then we also have uh, an Omaha location um, for our grad program. So we have eight of those and then 12 pre-professional programs as well. And a little bit about Luther Library, where I work. Um, this is a picture of what our library looks like. Um, according to OCLC, we have about 280,000 holdings. I don't know how much I believe that number, but um, according to them, that's how much we have. Um, before I came, they did do a very large weeding project. Um, our library used to be wall-to-wall -wall shelving. Um, um, wall to wall stacks. We didn't really have any study tables or computers around for people to use. Um, and so before I came in, they knocked out about half the stacks. Um, so now there's more room um, for study tables and stuff like that. And then I'm currently doing a weeding project myself to kind of um, weed some of that older stuff that nobody's 
that's not circulating, nobody's checking anything out, um, just to make more room for those study spaces. And we're hoping to get some more study rooms in as well. And then our physical collection is the typical, you know, fiction, nonfiction, um, DVDs, closed reserve, and music scores. And then our electronic collection is those journals and ebooks as well. So what did Luther Library have, or in this case, didn't have before I started? Um, and so the four things that I listed were um, the big ones. There were there are several others, but these are kind of the big ones that I wanted to fix. Um, and one of them is no programming involving students, faculty, and staff. So, you know, as a library, we did have, you know, we're a pretty high traffic building on campus um, just because we have that quiet space for the students to um, study and do their homework. Um, but there was nothing, you know, really outreach. There was no getting the students in for something other than just their studies um, and having them engage with each other. And I wanted to um, change that. Um, that was a big one, especially involving the faculty as well and not just the students. Um, so to give them a way to um, interact with each other outside of the classroom. Um, there was no library displays. It was just the stacks and that was it. Um, and I, so I highlighted a few things that I've done um, in the last two years that I've been here. Um, so recently I did a, a fiction book donation um, among the campus community to see if people would donate books. And we actually had a really good response. Um, and so I do book displays. Um, we have a lot of really cool archives in the um, at the university that a lot of people never knew about because nobody ever went in the archive rooms. And so I made it my plan to do that. And now we have, um, I do archive spotlights every once in a while. We have glass cases in the library to do that. And then um, just different displays for library holidays, not just, you know, calendar holidays like Christmas and um, Halloween and stuff, but also library related holidays like, you know, band book week, uh, band book week, um, you know, National Library Week. Um, so I highlight those as well. Um, and again, no library resources outreach to the students, faculty and staff. So when I came in, you know, there was no class presentations on how to um, navigate the databases. There was no um, real knowledge of how to use them. You know, we had them listed on our website, but nobody knew how to get there or how to use them properly. Um, and no library related communication to the staff, um, faculty, um, students and staff. Um, so just nobody knew what was going on in the library if there was changes um, nothing was really communicated to anybody um, out in the campus community so my solution to that um, the first thing i did when i started is i met with all the deans um, and then when i met with the deans of each of the colleges i um, extended that to bigger groups with um, other faculty members um, and then I also reached out to the students because, um, you know, even though it's, you know, Midlands Library and I work there and I, you know, put on things in the library, it's the students that are utilizing this information and these resources. So I wanted to know what the students wanted and what they expected out of the library um, to make sure that they are successful in their um, college career. Um, and I also created a line of communication to faculty, staff, and students. And by doing that, I send out a pretty much bi-weekly um, e-newsletter through an email. Uh, we, I called it Check It Out, um, just kind of a library pun. Um, and I send that out usually just to faculty and staff, but sometimes I involve students if it relates to um, something that they um, should know about, like database stuff. Um, and I just talk about anything I do, any changes, any displays, tips and tricks of um, researching and databases. Um, and I created displays that interest the campus community. So again, um, those archive spotlights, people had no idea what we had in the archives. And so I kind of broke that out and put them on display. Um, and then, you know, just like I said, with those, uh, with that fiction book donation, I. Uh, made a display for that. I didn't think it was going to be super popular, but we actually, I just put it up 
maybe a few weeks ago, and there's already been about half the books uh, already been checked out and circulated. So I was really excited to see that people were actually taking them and um, reading them. Um, and creating outreach to the community, I wanted to do that because, you know, people live in Fremont. There's, there's 26,000 people in this town, but um, not a lot of people know that there's a university here and not a lot of people know there's even a library on campus. They just think there's the public library in town and that's it. Um, so I wanted to make sure people knew that, you know, hey, we're here and we're doing things and, um, you know, being able to um, in include them in some of the stuff going on in the library as well. And then I also created a library resources canvas course. So um, we're not lucky enough to have like lib guides and research guides that a lot of people have. So to fix that, I decided to make a canvas course since that's what we use um, on campus. And so in that course is a lot of tutorials on how to search um, the databases, do proper research and stuff like that. Um, I split up the databases by um, by major, so you know, an education major decides to look in the databases, but have, has no idea where to start. I have all the relevant databases listed on there for them, the best periodicals that we have, and um, any open source information that they can find too. And then just citation and plagiarism information. So um, it's kind of a one-stop shop for them to find all this information and library resources. So now I'm gonna talk about some of the programs that I've done um, and highlight the ones that um, kind of really started um, to get things going for my programming here on campus. Um, so my first program was book club and that included faculty, staff, and students. Um, so uh, what I did is I, um, I sent out a Google form to faculty, staff, and students, and it included 10 titles of various genres. Um, and the biggest um, help with all of this is uh, at the Nebraska Library Commission, they have book club kits. Because at first, when I thought about this book club idea, I was like, okay, if this program takes off and you know, I have to buy 20 books of the same title, what am I gonna do with 20 of the same book? So when I found out that they do book club kits at the Library Commission, I was super excited. And um, so we utilized that um, to get a, a bulk um, title of books. And so I, send, I, I pick out um, different titles of different genres, usually bestsellers, and then I have them vote on which one they want to read. Um, and then I compile that and I announce the winner. And I'm going to show you in a second on how I announce the winner. Um, but um, in our first meeting, what was really fun is we voted on a book club name, which ended up being the Perfectionist Book Club. Um, and then a, uh, one of our students in the book club actually created our logo, and there's an arrow pointing to the logo. But so that was really fun too. Um, and then the great thing about this program is it costed absolutely nothing, because um, uh, I know with budgets being tight. Um, especially on our small campus. We don't have a lot of money to work with. So the fact that it was basically a free program, it is, that's the greatest thing. Um, and then on the right, I have an example of what my flyer looked like um, for that particular book. And um, with this next slide, uh, this is what I use to reveal our uh, book club um, the book that we're gonna um, read for book club. And I actually saw this being done at another conference I went to. And it's really cool, it's a lot of fun to make. I don't know if you've any of you have ever um, made it like this before, but it's um, in iMovie on the iPad. Um, it's the green screen effect. So what you do is you take a picture of, in this case, a cover of the book, and then you overlay that with the green screen effect on iMovie and I used green Play-Doh um, for the green screen. Mm -hmm. And then um, and then it's a short video, but um, basically all you do is, um, what I just did is spread it out and so people can kind of see it. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's a, a close-up of my hands, but whatever. Um, 
and then you kind of move it around so everyone can see um, what the book looks like. And that was my big reveal for what books we were going to read for that month. And I put oh, it out on very Facebook. Cool. I like that. That's so slick. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was super excited to find that out at a conference. I was like, oh my gosh, I have to try this. Um, <laughs> So that would then be posted on our Facebook page, and I sent it out on that um, uh, newsletter that I um, sent out um, to faculty, students, and staff. So what did this program accomplish? Um, it created an opportunity for students to engage with faculty outside of the classroom. You know, a lot of times, I mean, it's probably not all students, but like when I was a student in college, you know, you, you see faculty and they're intimidating and you're, you know, sometimes afraid to go up to them, ask questions and kind of sit in the back of the room and not say anything. So it was um, it was fun to see students and faculty, um, you know, discuss, debate, play off each other um, and be able to do that outside of the classroom um, in a more relaxed environment. Um, it allowed for leisure reading instead of the assigned texts for those students. Um, because as a librarian, you know, I hear a lot of, oh, yeah, I like reading, but I hate reading what I have to read, um, what I'm forced to read. So like textbooks or, you know, if you're in an English class, like those old classic um, texts. So it allowed for people to, you know, read something that they may be interested in or maybe have never read from before. And that's what that next bullet point is. It made them read material outside of their usual genre. So like for me, I'm a huge fantasy nut and that's all I read, but the bulk, it seems like the bulk of the readers in the book club are um, historical fiction readers. I've never read that genre before. I thought it was gonna be super boring, but then um, one of our first books was The Nightingale and I was like blown away by how great it was. So now it's one of my favorite genres to read. So it's, it allows people to read outside of what they normally read. Um, I also thought it was a safe first step to introduce um, programming to campus because, uh, I mean, it doesn't, you know, there's not a lot that goes into it. It's, it's a free program, so it's not costing you anything. Um, there's not a lot of work put into it. You know, you get the book, you read it, you discuss, that's it. There's no, you know, activities that you're afraid that people won't like. Um, there's no worry that people will come in and look at what you have and then walk away because they don't like it or something. Um, so I thought it was a safe first step. And with students being involved in it, because that's the hardest part about being on campus is getting those students involved in these programs, is um, since students were involved, they could then you know, possibly hope that um, they thought the program was successful. So then they would think that maybe future programs that I put on would be successful. And then um, also with that, that allowed the program to grow because of word of mouth. So students were, um, you know, telling their peers to join other faculty members, um, told other faculty members to join. And so it has grown pretty big um, in the last um, several months, um, even with COVID, because we've been having to meet virtually. So I was really excited about that, how much it has grown. Um, my first holiday program that I wanted to talk about is my Halloween program. This poster is from this year, not last year, um, because we did things a little bit differently this year because of COVID. Um, but the big thing that I wanted to make sure of with these programs is to know what the students wanted. Because um, I could put on activities and, you know, spend money on stuff and it wouldn't interest them. And so I wanted to make sure what was going on at this program they would actually want to be a part of. So I asked the students what they wanted. Um, so the first year I had this, I set up a whiteboard out in the lobby and I had them write down programs that they were activities that they wanted to see. And then if it was already listed, they would vote on which one they wanted. We didn't do that this year because obviously COVID, I didn't want a bunch of people touching the marker and um, that. So I what I did is the um, activities we did last year, we just did this year. Um, but this year, um, at the end of the night, we usually watch a Halloween themed movie. And last year they were able to vote for it on the whiteboard, but this year we got you know, more technical and um, used the QR code. So then they just voted what, for what movie they wanted to see. 
Um, and then I had different stations for activities. I had, you know, the escape room in the back of the library so people could spread out um, and not be confined to a small space. Um, and then the nice thing about this program is even if students weren't there for the program specifically, but they were still in the library studying or doing homework or something, um, they were able to take a break from what they were doing and just do whatever they wanted in the program um, or during the program. So I knew that was going to happen a lot with the pumpkin painting just because, you know, it's kind of like relaxing. It's like an adult coloring book. You know, you want to take a break from five hours of studying and do something else for a little bit. Um, so I made sure I had a lot of supplies for the pumpkin painting um, because I knew that was going to be a more popular thing. Um, and I did not use full size huge pumpkins. I used the small ones because I knew if I used the big ones, it would just be a crazy mess. Um, and this one, this cost um, just around $50 um, the first year. The second, this year, it was a little bit more expensive. Um, I think it was around $70, only because I had a um, photo booth this year. Um, so I added a couple more new things, um, but still pretty cheap, in my opinion, um, for a program for campus. So um, that's always nice for my supervisor to see that I'm not spending a, a large amount of money. Um, and then the big thing is, is I work with a lot of help desk students because our CERC desk and help desk are one and the same. So those uh, work study students that work at the help desk do the daily library tasks as well, like checking books in and out and stuff. So I have a lot of um, communication with the students. So I ask them, how can I make sure that you guys come to this program? And the most popular answer they said was have food. If you have food there, anyone will come. The students will get out of their dorm and come for free food. So I made sure that I have food at my programs. <clears throat> and these are just a few pictures of um, what it kind of looked like this year. So what did this program accomplish? It created an opportunity for students to engage with one another outside of the classroom. So whether it was, you know, your, your friends or somebody you've never even met before on campus, um, it gave them control of what activities were being done. So like I said, you know, it's one thing for me to put on a program and hope they show up. It's another when they know that they're having a little bit of control and have a voice in what they want to see. Um, so you know that you're doing activities that they're going to be interested in. Um, it got students out of their comfort zone. So again, it let them engage with people they may have never engaged with before. With the escape room, they may have never done one before. So it got them out doing that and allow the program to um, grow again because of word of mouth. Um, there were several students this year that um, came up to me around like September, early October and asked me, when is the Halloween program gonna happen? Um, so it was fun to hear that, knowing that, that my first year here with that first program, it was successful that they wanted to um, have it again this year. And again, we could still have fun even with um, the pandemic going on. Um, it was just obviously more spaced out, um, distant, um, so everyone could be safe and still have fun with it. Um, the other program that I put on, um, I did with the community. So I had um, people out in Fremont coming into the library. And what I did is I did pictures with Santa. Um, as a parent, I know the most irritating thing is, you know, the Santa at the mall, you take your kid there, you pay, you know, 50 bucks for a picture that usually doesn't turn out because your child doesn't want anything to do with the big guy in red. So I was like, how can I ensure that the community would actually want to come and do this? And I thought, well, having the parents bring their own camera, take as many pictures as they want, and they don't have to pay for anything. So I had, um, I, that's how I marketed it. I let parents and students bring their own camera. Um, uh, there was also some story time sections in there uh, for the kids and Santa. And then um, it was fun because students actually volunteered to be Santa and his elves. So that was um, a lot of fun for them to be able to do. And then there were other picture opportunities around the library for them. Um, and again, this program was, costed absolutely nothing. Um, I was able to borrow the Santa suit from the performing arts department. Um, so this was also a free program. 
And these are some of the pictures of what it looked like. So we had Santa's throne there um, by the Christmas tree, and then we used paper reams for a paper snowman, um, and then we did a book tree as well. Um, so what did this program accomplish? We were able to, again, outreach with the community, again, saying, hey, we're here, we're doing things. Um, it allowed students to engage with the community as well, um, because, you know, a lot of times you're in college and you're just in this little bubble of the campus community and don't really look out beyond that. And so they were able to um, engage with the community and also engage with faculty members who came in and brought their young kids um, outside the classroom. And it promoted the university. So again, it said, hey, we're here. And if you have, you know, soon to be college aged kids, you can think about applying to Midland. Um, so I was able to promote the university and I was able to inform the community about um, this program and other activities being done on campus. And to do that, I was able to partner with our business development manager who promoted the program for me over the radio, social media, and newspaper. And I was actually blown away by how many community members came because um, the program was kind of last minute because I didn't think I would actually get, um, um, I would actually be allowed to do this, but I was. And it was about a week that I had to prepare for it. And we actually had a really good turnout from the community. So um, it was a lot of fun and probably my favorite um, program. Unfortunately, we couldn't do it this year, um, but I have really big dreams for next year. So hopefully that'll work out. And these are just pictures of other programs that I've done. Game night is a really popular one. The one on the um, left is actually a book cover that I helped make with the student, um, Alexander Law, that's written there. Um, I actually found out that this student has written several books and short stories on his own time. And so I was like, hey, why don't we read one of these for book club? Um, so it was cool to actually read a student written book in our book club. Um, and then that's also another student posing for the um, cover as well. So that was a really cool thing to do. Um, and he was really excited about that to be able to show off his work to other students, faculty, and staff. Um, and then I've also, um, you know, I do new book features. Um, and then one thing that I'm currently working on is the Warriors and Friends. So again, with um, our community members and um, um, students that write books, um, we actually have a lot of alumni and faculty members and even community members who are published authors. And so my goal was to get um, those books from them and have a whole display about it. And I've had um, a lot of donations of works for that. So it's slowly getting built up, but that was um, the big goal for that one. And then um, the poster in the middle is just to talk about, you know, uh, new students that come in who may not know about us or know what we have for resources. They're able to scan those QR codes and learn more about um, what's all in the library and all the resources. And then um, these are some of my displays. Um, I have a diversity display on the right. Um, just to, um, I made a scra scrapbook of all the diversity things that um, Midland has done in the past. Um, like we had an MLK march um, several years in a row. Um, our Black Student Union did a lot of um, uh, programs and outreach too. So I made a scrapbook highlighting of everything that we've done in the past because we're um, we've been doing a lot of that presently, so I wanted to highlight what we've done before. And then the middle one is a glass archive case of um, stuff that we had in the archives. And the one on the left is, I wanted to make a display of uh, all the countries that our students are from, because we do have a lot of um, exchange students come here. Um, And this one, I don't know how many people have ever done this before or have seen one of these before, but since a lot of libraries had to shut down, a lot of people have been creating virtual libraries. Um, so basically everything on this page is clickable um, and it'll take you to a certain um, website or 
profile or something. I'm going to see if I can do this. Hopefully it doesn't screw my um, stuff up. But just to show what it looks like, can you see this? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. We're seeing this, the desktop. Yep. The... Okay. Um, so if you have never made one of these before, they're actually really easy. You make them in Google Slides um, and you just, everything is clickable. All of us at the top here are all um, faculty members in the library. And so you click on our profile, you get our contact information where we're located in the library. Um, you click on the bookshelf, that takes you to our catalog. You click on the calendar, that takes you to our hours and any updated programs that we're having. And then the sign over here, you know, you click on the databases, it takes you to our database site and information about the help desk and academic resource center. And the iPad, we're an iPad, one-to-one -one iPad initiative school. So this will take you to all your iPad rules and um, paperwork you have to fill out. So even though, you know, we were closed down for a while because of COVID in March, starting in March. And so even though, you know, we weren't open, I created this virtual library for people to still utilize and find information um, that would help them um, for resources for the library help desk anything like that um, and i promoted this over facebook our my check it out e-newsletter um, and i'm working on getting it on our website but we're getting a new website right now so um, i want to wait till that's done before i put this on there but i highly recommend making one of these they're super fun <laughs> Yeah, one of our previous presenters had a version of this too. I do have to ask though, because I'm sure other people may be wondering too, um, mm -hmm. what does clicking on the cat get you? <laughs> it's just there. <laughs> I actually got that question a lot when I first yeah. presented this um, to faculty. It makes members. me nervous too, the, the cat and the, the, the teacup there. I'm like, I don't yeah. want to follow up that, but. <laughs> yeah. yeah, unfortunately it doesn't take you anywhere. Um, <laughs> Hopefully this will get me back. Okay, are we good? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah you are. Um, we do have a question actually, it was just from a previous oh. screen, so I think I might jump in with it now if you don't mind. Um, someone wants to know, um, how did you create a QR code? You had a QR code on the previous? Oh yeah, uh, I don't know if this is the right way to do it, but um, <laughs> they have the QR code generator. I mean, you just go to um, Google and type in QR code creator mm -hmm. or generator or whatever, and I just use the website that, it came up, I think it's qrcodegenerator.com or something like that. Okay. That's what I do. I don't know if it's right, but that's Yeah, fine. I don't know any particular ones that are good or bad. I just know that, yeah, they're out there that you can use, yeah. Yeah, they've worked for me so far, so hopefully it's okay. <laughs> um, so creating trust um, on campus. Um, so meeting with the faculty members, that was, Again, I said earlier, that was the first thing, I met with the deans first. And then we broke out in bigger groups. I met with faculty members in each college. We discussed um, what was missing from previous years um, and what they expected moving forward. So the biggest problem on this campus is since there was no knowledge of any library resources, there was no presentations about them, um, that was where they needed that to be done in the classroom and for their students and faculty to understand um, because they weren't able to really assign you know proper scholarly research papers to their students because the students didn't know how to use them or use the databases so a lot of those research papers they get back are from google and unfortunately wikipedia and they didn't want that to happen anymore they were getting frustrated with that um, so after I met with them, we kind of started setting up my first classroom presentations. Um, and obviously it started with just, I think just speech and the regular comp classes. Um, but they ended up being a success. I, you know, proved myself that I knew what I was talking about and it helped the students. Um, so it led to those faculty members telling other faculty members for me to come into the classroom. So, what did that accomplish? My classroom presentations grew from zero to 60 visits in the first the first year I was there. Um, so I, by myself, went to 60 classrooms, um, talked about you know all of our library resources, how to navigate the databases. Um, 
and that has not slowed down. Um, even with the um, us turning virtual, I was still going into Zoom lesson or Zoom classrooms, um, and I'm still going strong today. Um, I get repeat faculty members all the time asking for presentations. Um, what I've been doing on our Fremont campus have, has reached our Omaha campus, um, where our master's programs are. So now I'm getting invited to the Omaha campus to talk um, to the MBA and MUD programs. Um, obviously, because of that, our database usage skyrocketed. Um, and then the faculty were able to start assigning database-only research papers. Um, and then so, some faculty, specifically the nursing faculty, were requiring their students to meet with me to approve the articles that they were looking at before they even began writing their papers. Um, and then I also created faculty workshops to teach them how to use library resources, because if for some reason they didn't want me to come to the classroom, at least they were knowledgeable of what was going on and they could um, show the student as well. And then again, that bi-weekly newsletter to keep the campus community informed. And what was also really cool about what these meetings accomplished and um, how that trust between me and the faculty members really grew was not only was I, you know, putting on my own programs in the library, but I was also partnering with faculty um, for me to host their programs in the library. <clears throat> so, Recently, we started an archive display in the art gallery. Um, the professor who's in charge of the literary magazine on campus has started coming to our library for the poetry readings. We have weekly readings from our English Honor Society members, and we're also getting career studio pop-ups, so to tell students you know, about jobs on and off campus. So being able to build that partnership between me and the faculty members and showing them and proving to them that, you know, I know my stuff, you, you can trust me with your students and with this knowledge to um, present to them, it has, um, you know, my amount of presentations and my um, face time with the students and the faculty members has grown because of that. So creating trust with the students um, having those programs allowed me to have more face-to-face -face time with the students. So they're not only seeing me in the classroom, but they're seeing me out and about in during these activities and programs. So it kind of takes away that, um, you know, intimidating faculty um, barrier that some students, you know, are afraid to go up to the faculty members and talk to them. And that kind of broke that barrier. And obviously presenting to the classroom made students more familiar with who I was, um, especially if, you know, they're freshmen, they probably see me a lot more than the upperclassmen. Um, and then I was able to co compile feedback from students um, about changing my programming and presentations accordingly. And I'm going to show you how I did that in a second. Um, but again, making the student's voice heard. Um, and have them kind of have control of things that's going on in the library and in the presentations. And then emailing and meeting with the students, like I said, broke that intimidating faculty mindset. Um, so now they're just, you know, they know where my desk is. They come up to me all the time for questions anytime. Um, you know, they feel I'm approachable. And um, so now there's, I get, like I said, students come up to me all the time, even outside, even if I'm not even at my desk. and I'm in another class, they see me in the hallway, they, they stop me, they ask me questions. Um, so the trust with the students alone has grown a lot as well. So assessment, what do I do to measure the data that I've just been talking about? So how do I know that um, I'm building that trust with the faculty um, and how is that reflecting you know, my presentations? Um, and how am I um, compiling that feedback um, and changing things accordingly to that feedback? And the first thing I do is library presentation surveys. So I made a Google form survey and every um, after every one of my presentations, I have the students fill out uh, my survey and um, it just has them tell me something new that they learned from the presentation, what they wanna learn more about and how they'll apply it outside of the classroom. And then I'm able to read that feedback um, 
and tailor my presentations accordingly to make sure that everybody, you know, understands what I'm talking about. And um, with that feedback, it also tells me that, you know, if there's some students that it just completely went over their head and maybe we need to sit down one on one and talk about it in more depth. Um, another big thing that I use to measure is analytics, obviously. Um, so I look at database usage, again, that has skyrocketed since um, this, the faculty members have allowed me to come into their classroom and talk to their students about how to use the databases. Um, my Canvas course usage, I'm able to look at that. So I know that these students are accessing my Canvas course after I leave them from my presentation. It tells me how long they've been logged in on it. So I know that a lot of the students are using it all the time. Um, I track my student meetings. So how many students I meet with to show that, you know, these students are trusting me. And so I'm getting a lot of, I meet with a lot of students. Um, and again, I track my presentations. Um, so I know how many I do every semester. So that, you know, again, shows these faculty members are trusting me to come in and talk about um, all this information. And again, in that first year that I was here, I had 60 presentations. And then I also track my archive requests. I get a lot of, um, you know, alumni or even, you know, people who find out that, oh, I have a distant family member that came to school here and I want to learn more about them. Um, so I track a lot of this information. Um, a lot of the uh, meetings and presentations I just track in Google Sheets, but um, it allows me to show, especially to my, you know, supervisor and in my um, performance reviews, like this is how much this is happening. And before I came here, it wasn't happening at all. And so it's it's been a huge change for the campus um, for that to be able to happen for their students um, so they know how to properly use library resources. And another one is voting. Like I said, um, with that, uh, the one on the right hand side, I had that um, whiteboard out there. They told me what um, activities they wanted done, um, and then people voted on it. Um, same thing with the left hand side. I picked three programs and I told them which one do you want to see in September. And then that um, Halloween program, again, that QR code, they were able to vote that way as well. And so that kind of helps me keep track of you know, how many students have voted versus how many show up. Um, and again, lets them kind of take the wheel on what they want to see. So that's all I have. Um, thank you for listening to my presentation. And uh, was there any questions? <clears throat> Excuse me. Awesome. Thanks, Laura. Um, yeah, we have some um, questions and comments. Um, that, that I was going to say that was that was great. Um, being uh, you know having coming into a situation where there was nothing and have to create something from nothing. That was a, lots of great um, tips and, and resources and, and hints for other people to um, borrow from you. I think definitely. <laughs> um, yes. Anybody has any questions or comments? Anything you want to share? Type into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. Um, just some comments, of course, you were, and I thought about this too, and from when I was in college, when you were talking about offering the food um, on a college campus, yes, free food is always the answer. Um, that works in public libraries and school libraries too, as long as you can have a way to allow the food in the building, try and make it happen. <laughs> Um, and then we know someone said that there's also a, a QR code option in Canva and other similar apps. So there's other places you can get um, ways to do that as well. Um, really just, yeah, as Laura said, Google it and you'll find um, many ways to do it. Not really a wrong way. <laughs> um, and we do have a question. You, you showed there in your in your virtual library there, other, you said other um, faculty that are, I guess, work out of the library. But someone has a question though, do you have any student assistants who help you with like circulation or is it truly just you alone all um, most of the time? What other, do you have any other? Yeah, assistants? so, um, 
so our circulation desk um, and the help desk are one and the same. Yeah, you said um, that you kind of share with, yeah. Yep. And they kind of do like, yeah, they, they check books in and out. Um, you know, they, they'll shelve books if they understand how to read the Dewey Decimal System. Some some of the students don't, which I totally understand. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. um, and I myself, I do have a one work study student who helps me like with projects that I'm working on or um, like if I'm doing a program, she helps me prepare that. So she just works, you know, a few hours a week. Um, but other than that, it's pretty much me doing everything else. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Sounds sounds very common, yeah. Um, we have the same thing in public libraries. There'll be one official employee, and then lots of volunteer help, or um, sometimes part time interns or things, just here and there. As as yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, and if somebody has a question about Canvas. They're not sure exactly what that is. Is that a, um, what is, can you, can you explain quickly what Canvas is that you're using? Yeah, so that's our classroom or learning management software, is that what it's called? Um, or yeah. system. Um, so like um, Blackboard is another one. Blackboard, yeah. um, and it's got all their courses on it um, that they take, and then it's got, you know, all their assignments that they do um, and whatever the professor um, puts on the um, in their different courses that they have. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's they just have all their information on there for their um, all their courses and everything. And yeah. so I made I made a course because I don't have access to LibGuides or um, I think that's by SpringShare. I think I think mm -hmm. um, so. I don't have access to that. So I tried to play with Canvas and use that to my advantage since I didn't have libguides. Yeah. Yeah, it's a way even um it's not, it does have online courses you can create in there, but even before all the needing of just online, it was just a way for the universities to organize on where the students can go to get information about their classes and, and updates and syllabus and just, you know, interact with their professors. I'm just reading through these. Um, okay, so I want to a little bit, if you can give a little bit specific about using the using the QR codes once you had them. How do you tell the QR code where to go for voting on the program choices? How did that? How does that work behind the scenes? I mean, creating a QR code is one thing, but then telling it where where you tell it to go. Can you explain just quickly how that process works? Yeah. So um, when we did voting for the movies specifically for my Halloween program, what I did is I made um, like a Google form and, um, you know, put the list of movies on there. And then I copied or I made a shared the link um, for anyone to access. And I copied and pasted that link into the QR code generator and then it generated that QR code. So then anytime somebody scanned the QR code, it brought them to that um, Google form to vote for the movies. Awesome, very slick, yeah. So it's, it's a quicker and easier way than giving out this long URL or something and saying it's, you know, www.whatever, whatever. It's just take your picture, use your phone, scan this code, and poof, you'll be there. Yes. Yeah, awesome. Um, and now that, oh, someone has a question that's more than what we're doing here. I wanted to know about creating one of those virtual libraries. Um, I actually just did, because I was curious too, I did uh, Google. And if you just search um, virtual library Google Slides, you'll find, um, I found a school library journal article with instructions on how to do it. And also a website for teachers where someone actually used Canva, not Canvas, Canva mm -hmm. to actually do the same thing. So there's a lot of... Um, resources out there you can grab that might be something for a future webinar that we'll have to think about <laughs> well, yeah there's so much fun <laughs> yeah yeah you get very creative with them um so we're almost wrapped up i think we'll wrap up we just have one little comment someone says they're blown away by your capacity and tenacity to get all this work done huge congratulations yes i agree good job on a work job well done <laughs> So I'm glad you're there at, at Midland for us and um, in the library, in the university, and in the community. That's awesome, too. All right.